Well, well, it's a house, man. What's up, Hossa Maniacs? It's me, Hossman, again, with another one of these Throwback Thursday old school videos. This is actually one of my first videos I did. It was actually scripted and everything. Uh, it's about Carnage, the first appearances of Carnage, whatnot. But in typical Hossman fashion, I get into all kinds of other details about venom and sticks and stone and stuff that doesn't matter, but it does matter to you because you're a fan of this channel. Anyway, if you look really closely, you can see my eyes moving during this video because I was reading on a teleprompter. Enjoy it, and I'll be back shortly, eventually later. Bye. Hey, hey, let's talk comics today. I'm Hossman17, and I'm really glad you joined me to talk about Carnage. One of Spider-Man's most deadliest foes, the spawn of Venom, and a seeming cash printer for Marvel, as he's been making near Deadpool level appearances everywhere these days. But before he was everywhere, he was nowhere. He was created by David McElhinney and Mark Bagley in Amazing Spider-Man number 361. His story actually started over a year before that. So it's not some big revelation that the origin of Carnage is tied with Venom, both on and off the page. McElhinney had been wanting to kill Eddie Brock off and put someone even more dangerous inside the symbiote, a sociopath with no moral compass whatsoever. But Marvel did notice how insanely popular Venom was. There was no way they were going to let him die. McElhinney would just need to create a new character then. So with that, he started to plant the seeds of the character that would eventually become Chaos. Sorry. Ravage. Sorry, okay. One more time. Rejecting the first two names, they finally settled on something better, and in Amazing Spider-Man number 333, we begin the journey that will culminate in Carnage. We start with the death of Venom. So Eddie Brock and his symbiote were in the middle of one of their We Must Kill Spider-Man missions when they ran afoul of the villain Sticks and Stone. Don't worry, I haven't heard of them either, but apparently Styx has the ability to kill any organic material that he touches, and that includes symbiotes. So Styx kills the Venom symbiote, Eddie breaks down and is just defeated. Spider-Man handily stops Styx and Stone, and the story wraps up, Styx and Stone get taken off to the vault, Eddie has to go to normal person prison, so he's taken to Rikers Island. So then Spider-Man goes off and he fights the Sinister Six, and he fights Scorpion, and he fights Tarantula. We don't really see Eddie again until Amazing Spider-Man number 344, not quite a year later in real time. So Spider-Man has his hands full with Cardiac, in his first in-costume appearance actually, and then we're treated to a brief interlude of Eddie in prison. He's working out, you know, doing push-ups, doing sit-ups, working his body in preparation for avenging his symbiote's death. You know, you really gotta applaud the man's dedication. So this interlude is where we actually get our first look at Eddie's cellmate, Cletus Cassidy. He's a serial killer, as drawn by Eric Larson, who did admit to modeling his appearance off of the Joker. So Cletus is making fun of Eddie when he thinks he sees something outside the window. But does he? Yeah, he probably does. I mean, we won't know for sure until issue 345, where Spidey's still fighting Cardiac and now Boomerang, I guess? So Eddie's still working out in his cell, but this time Cletus definitely sees something outside the window, as the very much alive symbiote spews forth into the cell and rebonds with its former host. The reunited Venom does not stick around long to answer any questions, and he escapes, leaving a little something behind. So the next two issues have Venom out for revenge, but much like the readers of the time, he seems to have forgotten about sticks and stone, and he again just wants to kill Spider-Man first and foremost. So this fight actually really works to establish two very important things about the character. The symbiote doesn't set off Peter's spider sense, and Venom absolutely will not allow anyone else to kill Spider-Man. Okay, now that the learning's out of the way, let's get ready to rumble, as these two have a knockdown, drag out fight all the way through New York and out to Yonkers, and that's like 15 miles. But that 15 miles is nothing, because in Yonkers, Venom ends up getting the upper hand, knocks Spider-Man out, and transports the web slinger to a deserted tropical island so they can fight freely without risking any harm to the innocents. Yes. Between issues, Venom literally chartered a plane to fly an unconscious Spider-Man to what I assume is the Caribbean. So I actually looked it up. Uh, it's a real place. It's called the Isle of Bones, and it is in the Caribbean. So that's like 1,500 miles at least. So... So they fight, and this is honestly a really good fight. Venom shows off his camouflage skills, and he really has Peter on the ropes like the entire time. Spider-Man finally manages a moment to catch his breath. He realizes that Venom's not going to stop until one of them is dead, and there's only one thing he can do. Find a skeleton, put his costume on it, fake his own death while swimming out to a passing by boat. And that worked. So Peter escapes with his life, and Eddie is finally happy thinking he killed Spider-Man. He decides to stay on the island, where Darkhawk eventually crashed and they fought, and... This video isn't about Venom, it's about Carnage, okay? So for that now, let's jump ahead past a whole bunch more guest stars, yearly another year in actual time, to Amazing Spider-Man number 359, where Cletus Cassidy is still in prison and seemingly talking to himself, but come on, we know he's not, right? Anyway, he makes his escape when he, like, pulls a guard through the bars. Ugh. The next issue, while Spider-Man and Cardiac are off doing something or other, we meet Gunny Stein. Now, Carnage actually looked through the phone book to find a stupid name to be his first victim, and Gunny Stein? 
Sounds kind of dumb. So that finally brings us up to issue number 361, where we get our first full-page appearance of Carnage. It was written by David Michelini, with art by Mark Bagley. Now, this has all been written by Michelini, in case I didn't mention that. I can't believe David Michelini's name isn't brought up more. He wrote nearly 100 issues of Amazing Spider-Man, and these are some really great issues, and a long run like this is perfect for planting the seeds and letting them grow like he did with Carnage. All this build up before the big reveal? This was 14 months from his first appearance to his big reveal. Now I wasn't reading this comics back at the time, but honestly I would have been wondering every single month if we were finally going to see who or what this Cletus Cassidy character became. We don't see drawn out setups like this anymore in the mainstream, and I wish we did. The issue begins with a full on Carnage attacking some guy named Chip at ESU. He says he's killing Chip simply because he can. It's not actually revealed, I assume Chip has a stupid sounding last name. Now Chip isn't an entirely throwaway character, he actually appeared before uh, a few months earlier in Amazing Spider-Man Annual number 25, and is a friend of Peter Parker's, which of course puts Spider-Man on the case. So Spidey sneaks into the crime scene, and overhears that the murderer wasn't human, and appeared to have a living, moving skin, and then swung away. So Spider-Man obviously assumes that Venom has returned. Now Mary Jane really wants Peter to just leave this one to the police, or the Avengers, or the Fantastic Four, anyone. But Peter of course reminds her that he has great power and great responsibility. Now, I haven't read this whole thing, but it seems like this time they're kind of having a rough patch in their marriage, which again is a part of great storytelling that you can put in one long-term writer. So Peter starts doing some research on Venom and quickly pieces together that Cletus Cassidy was Eddie's cellmate and he escaped a couple of weeks ago. He does a little more research and he begins to realize how dangerous Cletus Cassidy actually is. I kind of like this page here where it shows uh, Peter and Spidey interviewing people that have known Cletus and these people are afraid to even talk to him about Cletus Cassidy. This is not carnage, this is just Cletus Cassidy the serial killer. So Spidey keeps following this rabbit hole and he goes to check out the orphanage that Cassidy went to that was burnt down years ago and for some reason was never torn down. He was simply looking for clues, but he actually found Cassidy and realized he was right when he comes face to face with Carnage. Oh, Carnage. So right away he learns just how dangerous Carnage is. He's stronger and faster than Venom, and he also doesn't trigger his Spidey sense. And on top of that, he can solidify his symbiote into blunt and piercing attacks. Now Spider-Man barely manages to scrape by when he's fighting with Venom. He doesn't even know how he's gonna survive against Carnage. He can't let down his guard for a single moment. He actually only fires off one quip during the fight. And you can actually feel how tense the situation is while you're reading it. I was actually starting to get a little worried for a minute. Unfortunately, Carnage does seem to give up as soon as a couple of cops arrive, and he pieces out of there, but not before writing Carnage Rules in his own blood. As Spider-Man puts it, he is one sick puppy. Later on that night, Peter sees on the news that Carnage murdered a family, and he decides right then and there there's only one person out there who can help him. He needs Venom. So he goes and gets his pal Johnny Storm, the Human Torch from the Fantastic Four, to fly with him off to the Caribbean to get Venom. Of course, the symbiote is weak to fire, so the Human Torch is a great ally to have in your corner. Venom nearly instantly takes Johnny out of the fight by using a tendril to hold him under the water. Johnny does eventually go Nova to get out of that, but has spent all his energy. So Spider-Man runs, and Venom kicks his butt again. But Johnny does redeem himself a little bit by resetting the sound system on the Fantastic Car to blast some Sonics. While he had the opening, Spider-Man pleads his case to Eddie. Meanwhile, Carnage is still killing people all the way across New York, but Venom agrees to come back with them to protect the innocents, but he makes Spidey agree that when he's done, Venom gets to go free. He doesn't like it, but Spider-Man has no choice. He makes the deal. So the three of them go back to New York, and then Johnny gets an emergency call from the Fantastic Four. He takes off, leaving Spider-Man and Venom to swing off to go after Carnage, as Venom can apparently sense his offspring. So they ambush him, and right away, Carnage throws out that he and Venom should maybe team up and fillet the spider dude. Venom says no, and they jump Carnage. Carnage shows nothing. He's not afraid, he's not worried, he shows nothing, and he overpowers them both easily and then takes off after throwing a baby out of a window. Now Venom and Spider-Man both die, Venom catches the kid, but Carnage is long gone. What's more, he seems to have figured out how to block Venom's sensory probes. So they need to find him and they only have one lead, and that's that Carnage appears to be after J. Jonah Jameson. Issue 363 starts with Carnage taking J.J. And the web swingers arrive, but it's a little too late. The police on the scene instantly want to bring in Venom, but Spider-Man of course assures them, no, no, I have it under control, he says, Venom is his responsibility. So then they keep looking for Carnage and they end up finding him at Madison Square Gardens where he's actually taken center stage at a rock concert. And here is where we learn a little bit more about what Carnage is doing. He's not just trying to kill everyone, but he actually wants to inspire others to kill too. He wants others to kill. Too. It's barely touched upon here before Spider-Man stops him, but it's another seed that kind of blooms in time and becomes part of Maximum Carnage. Carnage is still mopping the floor with Spider-Man and Venom, without even breaking a sweat. And then the fight winds up in the subway, and Carnage is using his symbiote to tear Venoms apart, 
When Spidey lands a lucky punch and knocks Carnage back onto the third rail, filling him with thousands of bolts of electricity. He bounces back up within seconds and is back upstairs after Jameson, who he left strung up on stage in the garden. Carnage is seemingly unstoppable, which is actually why I kind of always wanted to see Marvel do like a slasher series about him, where he's the unstoppable killer, like Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees making his way through some small town killing teenagers, something like that. So Venom keeps Carnage busy while the webhead saves JJ, and he gets an idea. He heads up to the control room and uses the sound system to blast music right onto the stage, completely incapacitating both of the symbiotic murderers. Spider-Man tells Eddie that he'll shut it down, but Venom insists he keep blasting the sound. He says, We can take it, but Carnage is younger and not as strong. Don't let up. So when the current symbiote is finally discorporated, he tells Spidey to stop. And Spider-Man says, I'm sorry, Eddie, I'm not going to. And the wall caller does not want to let up until it's safe, and Venom pushes through the pain and strikes at Spider-Man, pinning him to the ground, vowing once again to destroy him. Whew. It's honestly looking like it might be all over for Peter, but Mr. Fantastic shows up and blasts Venom with his sonic gun. And it wasn't a coincidence, and it, not just lucky timing. Spider-Man actually pre-arranged to have Mr. Fantastic and the Human Torch waiting to take Venom down once he helped take down Carnage. Now, having read this a few times, it does occur to me that, you know, maybe they could have helped earlier, but, you know, that's storytelling. And of course, what would a Spider-Man story be without an ungrateful J. Jonah Jameson telling Spider-Man that he's a jerk for not keeping his agreement with Venom? You know, not, hey, thanks for saving me, not, good job, Spider-Man. All he said was, Captain America would have kept his word. <laughs> what a dink. And so the issue ends with Peter's parents arriving in New York and the Carnage symbiote dead and he's never going to return again. Obviously he'll be back again. In fact, this video did start off as Maximum Carnage and I was reading that story, it occurred to me, I'd never actually read the origin of Carnage. So I read that. And I'm really glad I did. Honestly, it's a great story and it really set Carnage up as a great villain. He's incredibly powerful and he kills without remorse. He poses a huge threat that Spider-Man cannot stop alone. Honestly, I'm really looking forward to reading Maximum Carnage now with this story under my belt. So listen, be sure to subscribe for when that video inevitably comes out. And I would really appreciate it if you would share this video with anyone that you think might enjoy it. Give it a like too if you want. Alright, so I will catch you next time. And just don't forget, if you can't afford new comics, reread your old ones. I've been Hosman17 and thank you.